so, so Nan Nancy asks this very interesting question, is there such a thing as an authentic city? Uh, yes, surely there is. My point is that it, it's not that there is an authentic city or, a, or an unauthentic city. My point is that the authentic city in and of itself does not necessarily hold more value by virtue of its own authenticity. That in a sense, that's one of the things we have to come to accept, that both its intellectual value and its commercial value is no longer determined by its authenticity. Um, and you know, Vegas is a very good example of that. In addition, I think we also have come to accept or to literally surrender that in many cases, uh, the copy uh, is as good as the original. And, and of course, this is not necessarily you know, a new argument. Uh, Benny Amin in an article from 60 years ago, a beautiful article, uh, you know, the, the work of art in an age of mechanical reproduction, way before the internet, way before all of the stuff, uh, had postulated that, and, and I think it's a very sound idea. Uh, I'll give only one example. Um, uh, two years ago, uh, the United States Postal Service issued a stamp of one of America's most famous uh, icons, the Statue of Liberty, which, by the way, I actually showed here in Vegas, if you recall. Uh, it was on the side. So they issued the uh, stamp of the Statue of Liberty, and it's basically the face of the Statue of Liberty, and they printed billions of copies of it. It's the stamp that everybody used. Uh, about maybe six or seven months after it was issued, uh, a philatelist, uh, the people who study stamps, looked at it and discovered, oh my God, <coughs> this, is not the stat this is not the image of the Statue of Liberty in New York, it is that of Vegas. <laughs> so, so the Postal Service panicked. You know, they didn't know what to do. They really didn't know what to do. So, so they, um, you know, the stamp is already in circulation. They printed millions of it. So they kept thinking about it, do we issue an apology? They thought about it for six months, they had a committee, uh, they, all of this stuff, and they came up with this very interesting conclusion, that the Statue of Liberty is such an important icon that it doesn't really matter if the picture was of the original or was of the copy. Um, and they actually said the ear of the Statue of Liberty uh, in New York is so worn out, but the one in Vegas is not. <laughs> so we, in a sense, accept the use, and, and then they, when they reprinted the stamp, they, they reprinted it as a Statue of Liberty, not the Statue of Liberty. <laughs> now, I, I don't necessarily say this to legitimize the idea that, okay, the, 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 the fake in this case has become exactly like the original. But I think what is really important to remember is many originals get lost over time, and the world is full of examples of heritage that, uh, whose origin cannot be completely uh, verified. Uh, they are fake copies that have become, by virtue of their singularity, the only copies we have, and hence they are the new originals, if you will. So, so, so my response is, yes, it's a very good question, Nancy, but that's not really the important part. It being authentic or not is not what will determine its commercial value. It's not what will determine whether people come to it or not. And I would even argue is not what it will determine its intellectual value, because that's something that it could build easily over time. Now, your second question is a much more complex question, for Can which we I- interrupt? Yes, of course. Challenge of course. Things. What about the value for the local population? Uh, very good. The example that I gave of the Bamiyan Buddhas is very important. The value for the local population. How do we define a local population today when we know we exist in a global structure, in a global order, in which the local population often cannot simply do what it wants? Or if it does, it violates what we would consider universal standards, if you will. So the people in the little you know, village called Bamiyan um, in Afghanistan didn't really care for the Bamiyan Buddhists, who've stood there for uh, 1,200 years. Uh, we, uh, in fact, if you know the story, the story was that uh, Mullah Omar uh, made a threat that he would dynamite the Bamiyan Buddhas if the United States attacked. Uh, George Bush, George W. Bush, came out and said, okay, we dare you to do that. So he did, and he destroyed them. And of course, the United States attacked like three weeks later, and the chaos that we now live with is, if you will, a product of this conflict. It is a conflict between a local culture that did not necessarily value what the world considered of great importance at the universal level. So I'm arguing that in the world of globalization today, we find ourselves in situations where these kind of conflicts are going to be greatly exaggerated and are going to happen much more frequently. And we have to deal with that. Uh, perhaps the way uh, to address it is to um, recalibrate the concern and say, how do we make sure that local cultures understand what is considered universal? How do we uh, instill in them uh, you know, a particular uh, admiration or respect 
for history, even if it's not necessarily their own. But I go back to a point that, that Nancy made earlier, which I like very much. As human beings, we're not always the same. We will keep changing. What we thought of as valuable 100 years ago may not be valuable today. And again, we have to live with that. The Eiffel Tower is a very good example. The Parisians were so embarrassed by the Eiffel Tower uh, 30 years after it was built. And there was a competition on what should we demolish it or should we cover it up? And most, most of the ent entries were, you know, make it a, a Renaissance or a Baroque building by having stone cover it up all the way uh, through. So when you think about it, as time passed by, the Eiffel Tower has become the quintessential definer of the city of Paris. No one uh, would, can imagine Paris without it. <laughs> okay. um, I'd like to ask um, why you think we seek out tradition, whether it's authentic or inauthentic. What do you think drives us to seek it out? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, the, the word tradition itself, uh, very interesting, it does not exist in many of the languages uh, that I had to study, if you will, in my attempt to understand tradition. In some languages, in some cultures, it simply means heritage. In others, it simply means custom. Uh, there's a fundamental difference between custom or the practices of, of, uh, uh, you know, of marriage, if you will, uh, and the notion of a valued heritage uh, that uh, has been left to us, but is something that we should continue to cherish and, and value. Uh, I think, as I said earlier, that, that tradition as a concept has to do very much with identity. And you know, the, the word identity has already been uh, you know, questioned. What is it? The, the actual definition of the term identity, its Latin origin, uh, idem, um, has to do more with difference than similarity. So. Um, I am who I am, not because I belong to this group of people. I am who I am because I'm different from you. So identity is more about difference uh, than it is about similarity. I think we often resort to tradition as communities, specifically as communities, when we feel that something is happening around us that is making us uncomfortable. So, you know, we resort to it as a, an instrument of protection. It is what we're going to use against this other that is coming and changing our customs and habits. Yet at the same time, uh, there's, there's this very specific uh, aspect of tradition, which I think is very important. Tradition has never been about anything but constraint. Tradition is never about innovation. It is about constraint. This is the way it was always done. This is the way we always built. Um, this is the way we should always build. Or this is the way, even, even if we're going to change, we have to stick to the parameters that are there. Now, it's very, it's very interesting because constraint in the practices of communities specifically often turns into restraint. As in, I don't have this constraint anymore. I existed in this culture, in this era, in this uh, you know, region. The only thing that I could do is build with this material. When things change, uh, I may continue to do so, even though I don't have the constraint anymore. A very good example comes, for example, from uh, the Greek Isles. Um, in Santorini, an island that many of you may actually know of, um, they uh, used to build, um, because they, they would build with stone, uh, they used to build a lot of uh, vaults. So many of the houses in Santorini are made of vaults. When a resident of Santorini went to Athens at the beginning of the 20th century and discovered concrete, uh, he came back and, and actually could produce the vault using uh, a certain kind of mix, uh, which was a volcanic mix, that is almost like concrete. Um, so what he did was he actually built a wood form and cast the vault. Well, but there's no need in the case of concrete to have the vault. The idea was that the form itself, that to have a house, I need to have a vault. And uh, I don't really structurally need the vault, but the tradition of the vault was so powerful that it, it had to be repeated. Now, when architects try to innovate here, it sometimes goes in the opposite direction. A very good example is what another very, very famous architect uh, that some of you I'm sure know about, Hassan Fathi, who wrote the book Architect for the Poor, did uh, when he was asked to build a new village called Gorna in Upper Egypt uh, to resettle uh, basically people who used to trade in antiquities and to settle them down in the valley. And it was just a move of about maybe three kilometers. So he built a village for them and um, he innovated the idea of building with mud with adobe block, if you will, in this case, and he built in vaults. Uh, when the villagers moved, they just hated the houses. And the main reason they hated the houses is because the vault 
in their tradition was associated with death. This is exactly what you build uh, for your tombs, not for your houses. He had missed that point, which was a big miss. Uh, <laughs> And the irony is that Gorna today is, one, is considered one of the architectural marvels of the world. We still teach it in architectural history and architectural theory as you know, this is an architect who truly wanted to innovate uh, by bringing uh, you know, local technology and building with local materials, so on and so forth. So, so, so I, I think people's relationship to tradition uh, changes from place to place. Uh, tradition in and of itself uh, is something that uh, absolutely has um, certain ideas that are passed down from one generation to the other, many of which are valuable, many of which are practical. But in and of itself, it becomes often limiting to the capacity of individuals to escape their identity, which is something that many people want to do, or their environment, or their community. I hope I answered your question. You, you did partially. I mean, I thought it was a very good answer to one part of it, but it didn't deal with why, why I travel somewhere to experience a different tradition. Ah. Why, so you, you dealt very comprehensively with why you know, I value local tradition or why that's important, but not so much that traveling to, to experience those other if, Yeah, the desire, it's very interesting because uh, much of the research, I mean, the, 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 the field that you're talking about actually more is the field of what is called heritage tourism. Why is it that people are drawn to understand uh, or to, to visit the heritage of the other. Part of it has to do with the fact that by visiting the heritage of the other, you are contributing to and celebrating and participating in a different collective consciousness that is so fundamentally different than your own, definitely. Uh, but one of the things that has come out of the research done uh, by you know, tourist historians is that tourists often seek the visual pleasure of many of these places without having to encounter all of the problems that are associated with it. The example that I gave specifically uh, of uh, Colonial Williamsburg is such. Uh, in fact, when slavery was introduced into the park, uh, the number of visitors, uh, even though that technically was supposed to be more authentic as an experience, the number of visitors went down. Why? Because most Americans are not necessarily uh, happy to be confronted with a part of their history that they don't want to remember. Today, as you probably know, in the past week with the very unfortunate uh, killings that occurred in the Charleston church, the big story in the United States has to do with the Confederate flag. Uh, so we have a flag that represents a political entity that existed in America uh, for you know, uh, 20 years. And you know, many of the people of these states relate to the flag in such a way, well, this is our heritage. I had great grandfathers die. So many states, could not remove the flag in the past. They just could not. And not just that, many people are very proud of the flag. And in fact, there are organizations that are based on the preservation of the flag. Now, this incident happens, and the perpetrator of the murders, a terrorist, no, no doubt in my mind, uh, is very proud of the flag himself. And in fact, he used the justification or the existence of the flag to come up with his manifesto. So America is confronted for the first time with this notion that part of one's heritage is this extremely unpleasant thing. Should we continue to celebrate it? Should we have it on the license plates of our cars? Should we have it on the, uh, like a small emblem on the flag of each southern state, as was the case? Uh, fortunately, um, and I'm very happy that that's happening, the movement that galvanized uh, around the removal of the flag was so strong that many legislators, despite their belief that this is part of their heritage, decided to remove it. So, so in a sense, there is this notion that uh, even when, when tourists or locals think about the unfortunate parts of their history, which is still their heritage, they have to make a decision. You know, should Germany uh, celebrate its Nazi past because it was a great empire at the time? Uh, I doubt that any German would say that. And if he or she would, they would be in big trouble. So, so in a sense, we seek difference because it allows us to explore but seeking that difference in and of itself also often requires us to take an ethical stance, whether we are the tourist or we are the local. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kylie from Place Partners. I'm a consultant, I'm an academic. Um, I'm fascinated by this. Actually, at the beginning, I was like, oh, gosh, it's been so long since I've listened to anyone um, really think about things that it's, this isn't fully formed. But it's been something that we've been 
I guess in practice and when, when we're talking to people who are making cities or making parts of cities, this sort of growing tension, I guess, between authenticity and the, um, I guess, the traditional placemaker's role in terms of creating third places, places that people connect to and are, are loyal to. Um, and the growing, I guess, desire for experience um, and the new place and the new thing. Um, and that these two uh, are often seem to be in competition with one another. I think it's sort of an interesting segue from kind of why we would travel to go and have a new experience that isn't ours. And, um, and, and, the, and I, I, I'm seeing a bit of age-related sort of aspect to it. So younger people perhaps who aren't as invested in their cities because they can't afford it or because they've got more choice than they have ever before, don't want to repeat things. They are actually not desiring a third place anymore. The, yeah, the focus has shifted for them. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you've got any input or... Yes, no, I, I, I like the question and I very much like the fact that it's coming from a practitioner because I, you know, I, I do practice myself and it's a question that we often face all the time. To, to what extent uh, are we as urban designers specifically uh, ones who first have to cater to uh, local taste, to the desires of local communities that we serve, to what extent should that be from an ethical standpoint, if you will, our main concern um, on one hand on the other hand, um, to what extent should our knowledge of the existence of other places that offer fundamentally different experiences be also something that we want to make sure we offer this particular group of people um, in, in, in the communities that we serve? I think finding the balance between the two is absolutely essential. And the balance between the two um, is not a, a formula that uh, can be applied everywhere. It's a formula that has to absolutely emerge uh, from context. Um, so I, I can tell you, for example, in, in the United States that there are uh, one of the things that today we often talk about with a great deal of dread is that all of the malls look the same. So we have to design different kinds of malls. Uh, those who engaged in this exercise uh, decided, you know, um, we don't really need to design different kinds of malls. We need to completely abandon the idea of a mall and come up with a new concept altogether to replace it. I think this is progress, and I think that this is a very healthy thing because in the process of doing so, we can maintain certain aspects of what people are used to while at the same time introducing uh, fundamentally new functions and fundamentally new forms uh, that will bring about new traditions that may not have existed before. Uh, the designers of, of malls, particularly in the context of the United States, back in the 40s and the 50s, as malls completely spread out and became the main um, you know, social space for American suburbs, never envisioned that it was going to be the place for teenagers. Uh, it has become the place for teenagers, but teenagers today deserve something different and desire something different and demand something different. So I, I think as designers, we absolutely have to, to, to think about that. I think, for example, in many parts of the world, there's a very strong uh, drive to return back and reclaim parts of the city and make it more uh, um, you know, uh, habitable. The problem, of course, this comes, again, that's the ethical dilemma that we face. It never comes without an expense, and the expense is often gentrification. The expense is often uh, the displacement of poorer people who seem to enjoy downtown when downtown is not very good. Uh, but to make it good, they are the ones who have to first leave so others can enjoy the new downtown. So, so I think your question uh, goes to the core of the ethics of uh, urban design practice. And it's, it's one, as I said, that will completely depend on context and on community. Yeah, just following on from that uh, comment about ethics, my question's related to that, but about speed or time. Yes. And the question to you is, uh, I can ask it best by way of looking at another field, looking at, at, at genetics. And when the science became possible to make genetic changes very quickly, those in defense of it often use the example of wheat or sheep, that we've been selectively breeding these things over many times, which is an effective form of genetic manipulation. We've made wheat, which we otherwise wouldn't have had, or sheep, for example, which aren't, if they're not shorn, they'll fall over. They naturally would not have occurred, but they're desirable for the purposes of getting wool. Has this phenomenon that you're discussing about values and identity and change of those things been always occurring? but has only been occurring in your subject matter at a much faster sp uh, pace because of transport or speed or internet or so on. But it's a phenomenon that has always occurred, or is this something which is a new phenomenon in the human condition? Boy, that's a difficult question. That's a really difficult question. 
Um, I actually think it is something that has always occurred in the past. Uh, the difference today is that it is occurring at such a speed and with such a magnitude and with uh, um, implications that are uh, you know, beyond the scale of what we are used to uh, in a manner that sort of requires us to pay um, much more serious attention. We can't afford the time anymore, if you will. Um, now, I have to say that I find the analogy that you use troubling. And I find it troubling because, because as architects and planners, we can never elevate ourselves. Uh, that's my humble view uh, to what geneticists do. Uh, because at, at the end of the day, uh, their work has grave implications on human existence altogether. Uh, our work can make people comfortable or uncomfortable, uh, can make people hate it or like it. Uh, and yes, it can impact certain generations in terms of you know, growing up in a banal kind of an environment. But it doesn't have the same kind of grave human implications. Uh, now, of course, there would be other architects and planners who would fundamentally disagree with me, who actually believe that um, you know, the, the, the built environment uh, has a fundamental impact on, on human life. As someone who's been in, in this field for the past 30 some years, um, I have come to believe that the built environment has limited impact on what we do. That in a sense, um, you know, Winston Churchill's this famous dictum that we make our environments and then they make us too, uh, ought to be examined. Uh, we make our environments and they influence us only. Uh, they don't really make us at all. So, so as a result, I, I would not necessarily want to see the debate about the physical environment, which is a very important debate. I, I don't need to minimize it whatsoever. It is my field. Uh, but I don't necessarily see it as so substantial to the existence of human life. I only see it as important to the sustenance of a good quality of life. But it embodies values and hopes. Absolutely, and it does. All the things that you've talked yes, about. Yes, of course um, it does. Not simply behavior or actions or how I feel. Ab absolutely, it does. It does. And I think it's mainly because of that that uh, you will always find that the struggle here is not necessarily between you know, different architects or different urban designers who have different visions for the future, although that may exist. It is uh, more so between communities that value what they have and do not want to change it, and communities that are willing to take the risk. Um, and I say that, and, and again, this goes back to some of the work that you showed me yesterday, the notion that uh, there are certain communities where people are so afraid of change. And they're often afraid of change because of property values, and that's it. Uh, or they're afraid of change because their, their eyes are used to certain aesthetic configurations, uh, or certain colors, or certain textures, and, and, and they, they can't take, take anything different. And, and I think, again, communities differ substantially uh, in this regard. Um, the history of, of architectural intervention is such that sometimes when you introduce something so different, it takes time for people to absorb it. But after a while, not only does it grow on them, it becomes precisely the thing that they look up to as part of uh, what they really value, and hence as part of their heritage.